And if there are any lingering doubts in opposition benches, I would strongly recommend that they read the open letter from the new Shadow Chancellor to the new Labour leader three weeks ago. And it reads as follows. Oh, and for goodness sake, don't pursue a graduate tax. <laughs> we should be proud of our brave and correct decision to introduce tuition fees. Students don't pay them, graduates do, when they're earning more than 15,000 a year at very low rates. Stopped from their pay, just like... Order, I apologise for interrupting the Secretary of State, but I want to hear every word of the Secretary of State's statement and every member should want to do the same. Secretary of State. Uh, I do believe, moreover, that we need to look beyond the graduate population. 55% of young people do not go to university. And we mustn't perpetuate the idea encouraged by the pursuit of a misguided 50% participation target that the only valued option for an 18-year-old is a three-year academic course at university. Vocational training, including apprenticeships, can be just as valuable as a degree, if not more. Finally, there is a challenge to all of us to promote a long-term sustainable future for higher education. And this has been a difficult issue for all parties in the House. Uh, those opposites have ranged between being early advocates of a graduate contribution, such as the member for Sheffield Brightside and the new Shadow Chancellor, through to those implacably opposed to change to the current Labour leadership who have apparently embraced a graduate tax. The Conservatives initially campaigned against graduate contributions but reversed their position. My own party consistently opposed graduate contributions but in this current economic climate we accept, we accept that the policy is simply no longer feasible. And that is why and that is why I intend, and that is why I intend, on behalf of the coalition, to put specific proposals to the House to implement radical and progressive reforms of higher education along the lines of the Brown Report. Yeah. Mr. John Denham. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, could I thank the Business Secretary for his statement and for his advance notice? Mr. Speaker, isn't the truth? that the coalition has decided to put the responsibility for reducing the deficit onto the personal bank accounts of this country's most ambitious and able young people, saddling them, saddling them with debts that many will never pay off when the government should be opening doors for them to make the most of their ability. On this side, we believe higher education is important, not just for individual graduates, but for growth, prosperity, job creation, and our ability to succeed in a competitive world. And that's why, a few years ago, we took the tough decision to introduce fees. And it is why Lord Brown, we invited Lord Brown to undertake his report, and we should thank him for his work. And I welcome the raising of the threshold the equitable treatment of part-time students, the emphasis on better guidance in schools and improved information on quality, issues on which we asked Lord Brown to advise or build on work we had begun. The £350 increase in the maintenance grant will of course be offset by the abolition of the £329 bursary for the poorest students. In the spirit of cross-party cooperation with the Business Secretary promised today to make available to this House and to the wider public the economic models used by Lord Brown. Mr Speaker, it's clear, isn't it, that Lord Brown's report has been crucially shaped by the assumptions he has had to make about coalition policy. Yep. Will the Secretary of State confirm that Lord Brown's report assumes that the teaching grant for higher education will be cut by 80%? It would effectively end public funding of most courses. And it would put the responsibility for paying higher education onto students alone. Will the business secretary confirm that some universities may lose over 90% of their public funding? Isn't the row within the coalition conveniently obscuring the biggest cuts to a publicly funded university system we have ever seen? Tough decisions have to be made to cut the deficit. But even on its plans for reckless, deep and rapid cuts, the coalition is only planning cuts of 25%. So why single out higher education for such a massive and disproportionate cut? 
Our competitors around the world are investing in higher education because universities are a key driver of growth and new jobs. Why is the coalition turning its back on growth? Mr Speaker, the business secretary says some universities may charge them less than £7,000. Does he accept that an average fee of £6,000 would cut university funding by £300 million? Does the business secretary says he's considering a £7,000 basic fee. On the 28th of April this year, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, now the Deputy Prime Minister, said if fees rise to £7,000 a year, Within five years, some students will be leaving university up to £44,000 in debt. That would be a disaster. Yeah. If we have learned one thing from the economic crisis, it is that you can't build a future on debt. So, what exactly is the difference between... What exactly is the difference? What exactly... What exactly, it was the Deputy Prime Minister's conclusion, and I asked, what exactly is the difference, what is the difference between the £7,000 per year fees, what is the difference between the £7,000 per year fees that the Deputy Prime Minister believes would be a disaster, and the £7,000 a year fees that his business secretary now proposes? And I'll say to the House, Mr Speaker, Promises were made by the Business Secretary and the Deputy Prime Minister at the last election, which should not be lightly thrown away. The trust of politicians is not just a matter for the Liberal Democrats, it's for the integrity of this House as a whole. Now, isn't it true, Mr Speaker, that Lord Brown's report makes proposals that would leave many graduates still paying off their debts when their own children start university? Isn't it true that while today the average graduate pays off their loan in 11 years, under these proposals the majority of students will not throw off the burden of debt for 30 years? Isn't it true that it's the middle income graduates, the teachers, police officers, engineers, middle managers, often the same people who will lose their child benefit, who will pay more than their fair share? They will pay longer, they will pay more interest than the higher earners who can pay off their loans more quickly. Isn't it true that women will be in debt longer than men and pay more interest on their loans? And can the business secretary be more explicit? Does he support the ending of the fee cap? A student taking a course costing £12,000 per annum will leave with a total debt, including maintenance, of £47,250, compared with the £32,000 debt the business secretary says is the basic. Can't we all recognise that in the real world, too many able students will turn their backs on the university and the course best suited for them, and they will be forced to shop around for the cheapest option? Will the Secretary of State accept that the proposals on access to the most selective universities in the Brown Report lack any teeth or any strength. So, Mr Speaker, could I say this? The Secretary of State once advocated a graduate tax because he believed that a graduate tax could produce a system that is manifestly fair and progressive with those who can afford it making the greater contribution. Now he's been told he doesn't support a graduate tax. Given the promises he and his colleagues made at the election, doesn't he agree that we all have the right to demand that any proposals he brings forward are asked to meet the same tests of fairness that he used to support? Yeah. Yeah. Secretary of State.